Praise the Lord, and good morning to you. It's good to see you on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning as we are now in the month of July. July today is Sunday, July the 5th, and uh, we are now approaching the second half, or have approached the second half of the year 2020, and we just uh, thank God. Man, we thank God. This has been one of those uh, years that none of us, none of us will ever forget. Our children will never forget. Uh, but uh, I hope it's not just because of, of corona and quarantine and all that that we don't forget. I hope that we will remember these, this, these, this year and these times for a time that we really saw in the midst of all of everything that's going on that we have seen and continue to see the presence and the power of God, maybe even in a greater way than we've ever seen it before. Well, we are excited to see you today. Thank you. I hope you joined our praise and worship time. And thank you to our, our praise and worship team and Pastor Jeffrey for leading us there and bringing us right into the presence of God through the praise and the worship and all that was there. And just a beautiful time. And now it's time to sit down uh, and break the word of the Lord together again. We're still in Psalm 23. So go ahead and get your Bibles out. We're on verse number five, but of course we'll read the whole uh, psalm uh, today just like we always do. We'll just read that whole psalm together and and uh, start off there and just, just, but today our focus will be on verse number five. And, and after today, we have one more week of, of the 23rd psalm and uh, still don't know anything yet. We haven't heard anything official, official, but the possibility that maybe at the end of, at the end of uh, this uh, week, uh, end of th this time next week, uh, maybe by the middle, the last Sunday or two of July, maybe we'll be able to come back together again and we'll be able to worship together again for the first time now. And good gracious, I can't even remember now up there toward the beginning of the month of March uh, that we were together the last time. So it's getting exciting and we thank you for that. We have started the renovations at the church. If you happen to be uh, on that side of the city and one day you're riding by, the church is open just about every day. We still can't congregate. We still can't gather there uh, uh, according to all the different uh, things. We do have staff meetings uh, uh, regularly and uh, our staff are on, on their, in their jobs, in their offices most of the week. Uh, you can stop by and see the work that's going on right now. It's a big mess because we're doing some deconstruction before we can do reconstruction. Uh, and uh, they're, uh, they've taken the, the that little the white drop ceiling that was at the front of the church we've taken that all down and uh, this week they've been digging in the cement slab putting conduits for new wires and more lights and more sound and things like that and then hopefully uh, starting uh, yesterday they were doing plaster work on that and uh, so it'll be we're hoping two weeks time the contractor said he could get most of his work done if we can provide all the the materials the lighting the things we're going to put on the walls the the different decorations two weeks to three weeks we hope that will be done so we know we can't come back together anyway until all that's finished but we hope that'll be just a couple of weeks uh, but we thank you for your participation. I had a couple of people this week tell me they'd like to give a special contribution above their tithes and offerings to help with that. And if you would like to do that through our regular giving channels, and they'll be up on the bottom of the screen from time to time, you can do that and earmark how you would like to uh, that money to go, if, you, if it is to go toward that, if it is to go to help us buy food uh, for people. We're still doing that every week. We're feeding anywhere from 15 to 30 families every week are coming by to get just some basic uh, uh, foods that we have. Uh, we still have maize, we still have beans, we still have rice, we still have oils, we have some salt. Sometimes we'll have a few other things that other people bring and drop off, but that's basically what we have, those non-perishable items. Uh, so if you want to help in that, uh, please, uh, we'd appreciate that. want to remind you, we've been announcing this now pretty much since last Sunday, and really Wednesday night we announced it uh, very officially, that starting, to, uh, starting tonight at 6 o'clock, Starting tonight at 6 o'clock on this format of, of YouTube and of Facebook, but also we're doing a Zoom uh, call. So some of you can come in and you can interact during the prayer times. You can be praying and we can be praying jointly, but we're going to do a seven-day prayer revival from 
tonight at six o'clock. Uh, we'll go one hour each night. We'll try to stay within that hour. If we go over, it'll be just a little bit in the prayer times and things like that. But we want to stay within that hour each night because we know many of you, you're in your homes, you have your family to deal with, your children to deal with, and we want you to be able to be a part of this, but also be able to just postpone the children. And we hope the children will join us. We hope they'll be a part of the prayer times and the devotion times. And uh, most of this will be led by Pastor Sharon. Uh, I will help her some, and she may in, uh, enlist some others to help as well. But she's had this burden, so we'll be doing that from tonight. And if we have some of you out there that really would like to be a part of that, but you just know you can't... Uh, uh, you can't afford the uh, data packages it would take to do that. Uh, we've been able to figure just through what we do sometimes with our worship team uh, that it uh, probably 150 shillings uh, a session, maybe a little less than that because the, we're not going to go as long. That worship Our worship team does a, a Zoom call every week, just about or every two weeks. and they But they're on about an hour and a half to two hours. We're not going to be on that long. But somewhere around 100 shillings uh, of data a night you can do this. But if you can't afford that and you would really like to be a part of that, and you have an, uh, an, uh, a way that you can download or you can join us via, via, via uh, FaceTime, uh, via uh, YouTube or uh, Zoom, and you would like to do that, then if you would get in touch with uh, Pastor Bethwell or Sylvie uh, or myself, uh, we will make sure that you get some, some data packages or some shillings to buy your data packages. And we ask you, just do that if you really can't afford it. We can't, of course, we can't do everybody in the church, but we want to help those that really would like to be a part of this and you can't be. Uh, we want you to be a part of this prayer revival. Uh, so if that happens, or maybe you know somebody that you just want to help and you want to send them uh, uh, some data each day or send them a hundred shillings I think you I, I'm not sure if you can buy data with bonga points but if you can buy it with bonga points and you can buy it from somebody else with your bonga points buy them some data with your bonga points and um, uh, if you're like me you're on your phone and I, I have mine and they just build up and build up and I don't even uh, don't even think about using them sometimes I don't even know how to use them or I, I know how to use them but just don't take the time to to deal with using them so uh, you're welcome to do that with appreciate you doing that okay well let's get into the lesson today let's get into what we have to do I don't think I have any other announcements I need to make other than just to thank you for being faithful thank you for giving to the Lord thank you for helping us to be able through uh, out this whole time since since the month of, month of March when we started this uh, how you have just been faithful in uh, giving how you've been faithful in praying how you've been faithful in communicating that when we would mention a need of someone in the church you would just come right behind that and you helped remember when uh, uh, Sister Joyce passed away, how our church just came in and, and, and helped so much in that issue. And even a few weeks ago when Pastor Joseph, uh, not Pastor Joseph, but uh, Brother Joseph, the, the shoemaker, the cobbler, uh, his house burned down, down in Kibera, how our church just came behind them and, and gave them a big push. And thank you for that. And any other need, there's been other needs that have not been even put out broadly, but uh, we've let the people know and people have stepped in and, and met that need. And that's what a family's all about. And that's what a church family is all about and thank you for being so helpful and such a special group of people to pastor and to be with Sharon and I uh, definitely feel loved we get com comments or people checking from time to time see how we're doing last week we were out shopping after I did my last Sunday's message on Saturday afternoon we went out and we saw several of our church family members out buying their groceries that day and got a chance just to stop and uh, at a distance of course talk to a couple of them it was good to see uh, see them there it's good to see uh, JP out and good to see sister and Jerry uh, we talked to them just just out there in the uh, mall at, uh, at Sarit Center. So uh, it's always good to be able to do that and see folks. And I've seen other folks, and I shouldn't mention names because I'll forget somebody. But God bless you. God love you. Let's go ahead and go to prayer. I want to pray for your needs as we go to prayer today before we get into the message. And then we're going to talk about uh, today how the Lord prepares a table before us in the presence of our, of our enemies. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's just ask his blessings on our life. Father, thank you so much for this time to be together with our brothers and sisters here at Calvary Worship Center. Thank you, God, for the goodness and the mercy and the love that flows from you to us on a regular basis. God, we can even say, and I believe it on a daily basis, because your word says that the mercy and the blessing and the love of God, every day it is renewed and every day it flows 
shows to us in a new way. And we thank you for that, God. And I pray that you would just be with our brothers and sisters today, all those who are listening out uh, on the on the uh, internet waves and the uh, airwaves the, through this telecast. Uh, Father, I pray for every one of them, God. I pray that your hand would be on them and you would bless them and you would anoint them, that you would be the lifter up of their head, that you would, as we talk about today, that you would anoint their heads with oil and that their cup would overflow with the blessings of God. Father, I pray that you would just be with everyone and every felt need that's going on in their life, whether that felt need is a physical need, a family need, an emotional need, a financial need, even a spiritual need, God. You can do them all. You're not, uh, your arm is not short and uh, not weakened and your ear is not dull to the, to the cries of your children. And we pray that you would just be to them, Father, that ever-present help in their lives. And I pray that even you would be with us today as we share this message and as we're uh, closely or coming to the end of this uh, series on the 23rd Psalm, I pray that the things that we share, the things that we talk about will be a blessing to our lives and that we'll never look at this 23rd Psalm again without thinking about some of the illustrations or some of the stories or some of the truths we brought out uh, from this uh, Psalm as we've gone through it in people's lives. And more than it just being good messages or teachings or whatever. Father, more than anything, I always pray that it would be something practical that touches a very uh, immediate felt need in the lives of our people. And if it does that, I don't, I really doesn't bother me if people don't remember next week what I've talked about. If it meant something in their life today and it turned something and it changed something and it helped them to see you more clearly then that was all that I need in what I do, God. And I pray that that would happen today, that the Holy Spirit would, would enact change and would enact um, uh, empowerment in people's lives today just because of something they hear. Maybe I don't even say it in the way they hear it, but the Spirit of God will put it in their hearts the way it should be. Father, and I thank you for that. Bless this time. Bless all the technology and the things of making this go together. And we pray that it works in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This mic's giving me a little trouble this morning. I hope we're not going to have a problem with it. I'm, I'll just keep trying to just put it in place. Let me just see if I can just move it a little bit here right now. Uh, see if that helps a little bit. Uh, so I'm just going to keep talking while I'm working on that uh, and see if I can get it in a little better placement so that it doesn't seem to be moving so bad on me. Let's see if that works. Maybe that'll work a little bit better. Let's try that. Let's get into our Bible. Let's go to, this is, if you're keeping notes, this is the Lord is my shepherd, part number five. Part number five, we've done, of course, so that means we've done part one, two, three, and four in the past four weeks. So this is the fifth week. And let's just jump right into it. And again, we're going to be reading just like we have every week, every week from Psalm, the whole third, whole 23rd Psalm from the King James, the old authorized version. Uh, that most of us don't read anymore. Uh, but uh, it's still a lot of us uh, that uh, went to school and did, did uh, Bible classes in school or Bible clubs or all the different things that were in our public schools for us. So I'd say those of us who are 40 and over, uh, maybe even 30 and over here in Kenya, you, you use this King James Version. And this is what it says. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. For whose name? For his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I did leave out one little phrase. So let's just go back and catch that one little phrase. And it's one I'm talking about today. I can't believe I left that one out. Thou anointest my head with oil. Amen. May God add blessing into the reading of His Word today. And as I said, this now, we're on lesson number five, but if you're keeping notes down through the, the each week, the, the numbers, we're on uh, uh, number nine or point number nine in our teaching. Uh, and today, point number nine is you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. 
in my um, uh, going back, and I've told uh, through this thing, I've told several kind of personal stories from my life because I think this psalm lends to our life as we're growing up. And uh, I grew up in uh, an area of South Carolina in the United States. It's in the so southeastern part of the United States. One of the first 13 colonies uh, in the, the uh, United States when it was being formed uh, back those hundreds of years ago. Even today uh, that I'm recording this is July the 4th and this is the day we celebrate our, our declaration of independence from the uh, uh, as a, to be a, be a nation that we would uh, not be under British rule any longer, but that our nation would stand on its own two feet. So this is a very special day. But I remember growing up uh, in my uh, childhood, one of the things that we would do, uh, not very regular, but at least a few times a year, we would have what we called family reunions. And I'm sure I know that uh, here in Kenya and I'm sure other, uh, just about every country in the world, I'm sure does things similar to this. And uh, most of the time, our family reunions that we attended were just kind of the local family, my mom's family or my dad's immediate family that kind of lived right there in the area that we did. One year, though, I remember when I was about 10, 10 to 12 years old, I was big enough to remember and know that I, I didn't have to have somebody watching me the whole time, but I was also uh, young enough that I just didn't get out on my own and I wasn't there by myself and, and somebody had to help me with, with my food and things like that that. Uh, but uh, we went to my grandmother Wooten, that's my dad's mother's family reunion. And it was at a place in Lawrence, South Carolina, uh, which is just maybe an hour's drive from uh, Anderson. Back then when we got in the car to go there, I thought we drove and we drove. I thought we had driven for hours and really we, we probably drove less than an hour. Or if it was over an hour. It was just very little over an hour. And we got to this big area. It was a big open kind of a pasture land, uh, much like we're going to talk about today. Uh, there were trees uh, in this land. I remember the tree big, 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 uh, leafy, beautiful green trees. And as we pulled up, there were hundreds of cars at this family reunion. And the family reunions I'd went to, the, the most that had ever been at any of them were maybe, maybe 50 people. Uh, and this thing, there had to be 300 or 400 people at this family reunion. And I'm thinking, man, my grandmother has a big family. And we didn't call her grandmother. What uh, our term for her was grandma. She was my grandma. And I uh, love my grandma. still love, I think about her sometimes and just tears come to my eyes. She was such a special lady in my life uh, as I was growing up as a boy. Uh, and so we got to go to this. And the thing that I remember more than anything else, because the, the little family dinners and reunions I had went to, we would always have lots of food and, and uh, uh, the table would be like just uh, like a table, a normal table. We have a six or eight foot table. Maybe there'd be two or three of those tables joined at our family reunions and, and that the food would be spread out nicely. It was full, but it wasn't overflowing and it would uh, look nice some similar to our folks at Calvary Worship Center sometimes when we do our our family days and we haven't done one in a long time uh, but we would do that and we'd spread the food out there and under the tents and people would come by and eat but when I got to this the table that they spread out in front of us that that people put food on and you got to remember when you do this everybody comes brings food. Nobody comes empty handed. Even the children, they may not bring food, but the parents of the children prepare enough food for their family to eat. And then everybody puts it together on the table. This table had to be, and in my child's mind now, I'm sure it's going to be in my mind a lot bigger than it actually was. But to me, it looked like it was a hundred feet long. Now, it might have been 50 feet. I know it was more than 20 or 25 feet, but in my mind, it's like you stood at one end and you couldn't see the other end of this table. And it was just packed and packed and packed and packed with food. And I honestly, I don't remember eating the food. I don't know what I ate. I do remember that my grandmother helped me get my food that day and she put it on my plate and uh, she served me and, and I sat down. And even I grew up in a time that children didn't eat first, that the, the men had gone through first then the, the ladies would fix the children's food before they got their food. Uh, so I remember that part of it, but I don't remember what was there. But that just stuck in my mind, that great big table. And as we get into our fifth week of digging into Psalm 23, on the surface of this reading and the surface of, of what we read, it looks like David has left the metaphor of a shepherd leading sheep 
and he's gone into a banqueting hall. It looks like he has now changed the whole tone of the psalm. And uh, one man observed the, that the 23rd Psalm has three sections in it. I don't completely agree with this, but I thought it was interesting when he said it. He said, you have the first part, you have the pasture lands. The second part, you have the valley, valleys of life, which was the valley of the shadow of death. And the third part is you have when, we, when, the, when the sheep come back to the, to the home and you have the tent or you have the dining hall, the home of the shepherd or the owner of the sheep. And that's where the banquet is thrown for then the shepherds who bring them back. And, and it has some validity. And if we embrace this view, uh, I think we would even have to add a fourth view because the next week's message, we're talking about that uh, he has... He he has prepared a place for us forever and ever that we will dwell with the Lord uh, in, in eternity. And uh, so we'd have to even say there's a fourth uh, el element of this psalm, and that is our eternal reward, our eternal home, which is in heaven. And But I can actually see, even if I don't completely buy into that fact of David has left the metaphor, I can, I, I will get to that in a moment. I can actually see this as a thought in David's life as he is leading his sheep and remembering the times as he's uh, uh, bringing his sheep uh, into the to the fold and, and to the places uh, that he led them through, that David could have called to mind some of the many banqueting tables that he has set at over the years. And as he brings his sheep to this place that we're going to see the pasture lands that they called the table lands, uh, that the uh, sheep were brought to for feeding for that final fattening before they would sell them at the market, David might have remembered some of the places that he sat at tables, where he sat the tables that were completely covered and completely uh, filled with food and filled with nutrients. And, and even though he was at this table, sometimes he was at a table like at King Saul's table. He was at a table and there were enemies at that table, namely the king himself and then some of the people that were with him that were against him. Or other times when he was sitting at his own table, when he, was, he had prepared a table and set a table there, but he had his sons there and several of his sons throughout his life had tried to take his throne, had, had done different abuse of things within the family uh, unit. So, so there's other pictures and other uh, uh, things that could be drawn here. But before I look at that, and I want to look at that a little deeper in a moment just to kind of bring my sermon to a close today, I do want to see what I really believe that, David's tr that David truly is still following the metaphor of a shepherd leading his sheep. And I want to kind of stay with that observance that, uh, that the, the same metaphor of him leading them in the pastures and leading them in the valley is in play here in this shepherd's mind as we see him leading his father's sheep from, from their home in Bethlehem and from whatever pasture lands they owned there in Bethlehem. And, and as we talked last week, he led those, uh, those sheep from the fields there in Bethlehem to the pasture lands of Jerusalem. And then they led them on through this uh, pass that's called the Valley of the Shadow of Death that we talked about last week that stretches from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho. And they would lead them through this one treacherous valley which was six to seven kilometers long that David would lead them through that one valley but when they came to the end of that valley uh, something would happen and something would take place because at the end of that valley they didn't just stay at the valley they began to make a trek up the other side of the mountain and that's where I believe that is that he's taking us to and I want to go back to the book that we've been referencing all along and if you if this is your first time joining us for one of these teachings on the 23rd Psalm one of the books I've been referencing and just using little snippets here and there but a lot of the ideas uh, uh, come from that is a, a book called a shepherd looks at the 23rd at Psalm 23 or a shepherd looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller and we've been putting that book on our uh, on our, all of our medias everywhere week and it'll uh, I'll even ask Jeffrey to put that up again today for us it'll be there it's a PDF form it's a free version you can go in and look at it and read it if you're interested but let me just read a caption of what Philip Keller was talking about and what he believed was happening and remember Philip was a shepherd himself he actually lived here in Kenya for a while he grew up here as a boy in Kenya uh, did some farming with his father and, and family here in the uh, area of Kenya of raising livestock and raising some sheep but then he also moved to the Middle East and raised sheep he said, in thinking about this statement, it is well to bear in mind that the sheep are approaching the high mountain country of the summer ranges. These are known as the Alplands or 
the tablelands, so much sought after by the shepherds. He said, in some of the finest sheep country in the world, especially in the western United States and southern Europe, the high plateaus of sheep ranges are always referred to as mesas, M-E-S-A-S, -S, mesas. This is a Spanish word that means table. So uh, what Philip is saying here is that in parts of the U.S., parts of Europe, and other parts of the world, even in Latin America, when these plateaus that you would climb up a mountain, and then when you get up so high in the mountain, you would have this beautiful plateau of land, a flat land in the tops of the mountain, uh, that would be called a a tableland or a mesa, a table that was spread out. We even have a, a, a very famous table here on the continent of Africa. If any of you have ever traveled down to South Africa, you've, you uh, stand there at Cape Town and you look up from the coastlands up and you see this beautiful mountain that starts climbing out. And as you get so high up there, probably somewhere 5,000 feet or so, that thing just levels off. And for the longest way, you have this beautiful flat tableland. And they call it Table Mountain. There's a, a close to my home in South Carolina. There's a place called Table Mountain and Table Rock. So it's, uh, these things are known all over the place. And oddly enough that there's even an African word, a Swahili word that we all know uh, for the table. I'm sitting at my mesa right now. My, it's not a mesa, it's a mesa, but I'm sitting at my mesa right now. So this is a terminology that's used throughout the world and was also known in this time of the, uh, the uh, ancient, uh, or not the ancient, but the early shepherds there in, in, in the areas of Israel and around Israel and those parts of the world, the Middle East. Uh, and they called these areas the tablelands, the outlands, the land of, 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 the, of the place where the sheep would come and they would graze in this beautiful table that had been spread in splendor for the Lord. So it may seem that David is referring to a table. What he was referring to as a table was these actually beautiful summer highlands. And, uh, and through these messes, though these messes may have been very remote and hard to reach, the energetic and the aggressive sheep, again quoting from Stephen Keller, t uh, sheep owner takes the time and trouble to go prepare the place the table, he goes to prepare and, and make sure the table is ready for the sheep to arrive. And Keller goes on, and I won't continue to read the quotations, but Keller goes on to say that the practice of the shepherd is that he, as they left that valley, they would start climbing this mountain and these mountain paths, these straight paths again, as we go back a few weeks ago when we talked about it, said he leads us in the righteous paths or the straight paths for his namesake. As the shepherd would lead these sheep up the straight path that would lead them to this mesa, to this table, uh, the shepherd, the main shepherd or the chief shepherd would go ahead of the other shepherd, the under shepherds uh, with the sheep and he would get to the table land hopefully a day or two days before the sheep would arrive and he would begin to prepare the lands for the sheep and they would gently lead the sheep along the path so that they didn't get frightful they didn't uh, get into uh, times where they would start rushing and running and falling off the cliffs or falling in holes they would lead them as they went along and then as they as he would reach the beautiful plateau. I'm sure the shepherd would get there in amazement from the many hours, maybe days of climbing and, and struggling to get up that high mountain. And he would look over this beautiful, beautiful land. And just to look over it immediately, you would think, oh, this land is beautiful. This is perfect. My sheep are going to get fat here. My sheep are going to enjoy this. They're going to jump and they're going to play and they're going to lay down. Uh, a few years ago, uh, some guys wrote a song about uh, the father's big house, talking about that place in heaven. And he he said, uh, my father's house is a big, big house with lots and lots of room and uh, a big, oh, I, had, I didn't write the words down. Uh, and he goes on to mention uh, uh, that it has a big yard where they can play football. And he says it has a big, big table with lots and lots of food on it. And I can imagine the shepherd when he gets up there after, after climbing out of the valley. And remember in the valley, there were nutrients there. There were some grasses down there, lots of water down in the bottom of the valley. But as they begin to climb, climb the mountains, there was none of that. There were no nutrients. There were very little grasses. There were just, just some of the, the, the old desert shrubs and things that were there along the way to eat. So he knew that when the sheep got there, they were just going to come and just go uh, berserk and eating this grass. 
But before they could get there, and while he had to get there so early, is that he had to make sure that even though he knew that enemies were all in that plateau, he had to prepare a place so that his sheep could come and they would be safe. In his writings and in several other places, I found out that there are at least three enemies that the shepherd had to protect his sheep from. The first one and probably the most uh, uh, dangerous for the sheep in that beautiful pasture land was poisonous plants. And that's interesting. You'd think, well, the first one would be the predators. And they are there. And that's number two. But the first thing is that in this, in this beautiful land with lots and lots of food and this table that is full with, with all of the blessings and all that the earth can give forth at an elevation like that, it also brings forth things that are dangerous and things that are not good to eat and things that are not good for the digestive system. And he would have to go through that whole area where he would keep his sheep. And I'm sure that there were not just one shepherd with one flock. So the sheep, shepherds would get up there and they would have certain des designated areas. So wherever his area was, he would go into that area and he would look for the plants that would cause problem to his sheep. The ones that would mess up their stomachs. The ones that would cause them to get infections maybe in their heads or in their in their uh, bronchial passages and he would clear out all of the bad uh, plants and all of the bad things that they would eat. But then the second thing he had to look for, he had to look for the predators. He had to look and, and if the big predators, the lions and the bears and those types of things, which we know were there at this time, uh, they would see them and they would be able to know them and, and probably even the other shepherds would have already warned that be careful, that's where they are, that's where the lions are, that's where the bears are, that's where the wolves might be or the wild dogs or whatever it may be. And they had to make sure that they prepared and set up safeguards, built maybe small uh, small uh, bomas to keep uh, uh, at least a protective cover. They would build fires at night to keep these animals away and they'd have to gather that firewood and things and they would keep the predators away. But then and there were also things like scorpions and snakes were also in those places. And he would have to walk around and make sure that snakes had not burrowed holes in the ground that one of his sheep would break a leg in. So he had to prepare the table. The way the psalm says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Another uh, uh, enemy uh, that was there, and we'll talk about it in just a few moments when we talk about the anointing on the head. There are also lots of pests. Anywhere you have grasslands, anywhere you have wheat growing and grass and edible, edible type plants like that, you're going to have flies, you're going to have gnats, you're going to have mites, you're going to have all kind of other pests. That these pests, all of them cause a danger to the sheep and the shepherd has to go through and make sure that there's not just just infested places where these pests are. But later on, we'll also see that he does something to his sheep to make sure that his sheep do not get infested with these things. And when we put our trust in God, as Psalm 23 reminds us, and when I say we put our trust in God, you, I hope you know now by what I mean by that, is that when we make the Lord our shepherd, when we have truly given of ourselves and say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I will follow him, I will direct for him, I will take direction from him, I will let him lead me, even when I don't understand and when I think I can do it better, I'm going to follow my shepherd. When we do that and we put our trust in God, Psalm 23 reminds us that He can and will do everything to provide what we need. And He will do that for us. And not just what we need, but when we need it. Even if you have walked through a dark valley, maybe perhaps the darkest valley you've ever been through in your life. Some of you are going through that right now. Some of you last year, I know several of our church families last year was uh, 2020 has been tough, but 2019 was a tough year for them and their families and, and the things that they went through and things that they had to, to, to bear under uh, uh, during 2019. And those dark valleys in life, 20, 2017 and 2018 was a tough time for my family. And uh, uh, going through with the loss of my mother and things like that. So all of us have these times when we go through the valleys and the darkest valleys. Uh, but as we go through these valleys, it's not a time to just throw our hands up and leave the Lord. But as we follow Him and as we stay with Him, there is a way that He's going to lead us out of that valley and that climb up that mountain to get to this table, this table land spread with splendor. It's a tough climb. It's a tough job. But when we get there, when we get to that place, God will lead us through that valley and He will lead us successfully until we reach this other side. 
That danger and loneliness will be behind you as you transition into another level of God's care and God's love and God's compassion for you. It is then after you leave the valley that you find the table of the Lord, the holy table that He has prepared. And all of us from different walks of life, uh, that table would be prepared with different types of things. If you're from, from an Italian descent with that Italian palate, it would be, uh, be laid out with, with all types of pastas and sauces and things like that. If you're here from most of the, the Bantu and Sub-Saharan Africa, it would have some type of a, some type of a, of, of Ugali or Sudza or, or, uh, they call it different things in different places. Uh, if Sharon were here, she could help me. I can't remember what they call them, but it's all cornmeal based uh, uh, type of a porridge or type of a bread that they eat with their greens and their meats and their chickens and their nyamachomas and all of that. And they love that. If you're in, in French, uh, from a French background, your, yours would be uh, just put with all these beautiful pastries and all these beautiful breads and baguettes with, with some nice meats with sauces on them and things like that. For us Americans, it would have some pretty good vegetables, but it'd be a lot of meat and potatoes uh, because we like our meats and we like our potatoes and all the things that go along with that uh, and with the breads as well. So all of us, our table spread in splendor is a different thing. But it's not about what's on the table. It's about the blessing of the Lord. The table illustrates abundance. It illustrates satisfaction. And it illustrates the everlasting love of God. God's people can feast at His table of love and grace and note that even though the enemy is around, even though the enemy, like uh, Peter talks about him, he's prowling as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, the enemy does not come to that place. Uh, some guys, when they read this, they say the enemy is sitting at the table. I'm thinking, in my idea, in my view of it, uh, I'm just thinking that the table is here. The enemy is out there on the periphery looking, wishing they could get in. But they can't get in because there's a shepherd there. And they know if they come near that shepherd, that shepherd will deal with them. And that shepherd will keep them at bay. And that's what our shepherd does for, her, for us. Later on, David brings the same imagery, imagery. Actually, it was before he wrote this. In Psalm 118, David said this. It's later on in the, in, in the Psalms, but it's actually earlier in David's life that he wrote this. He said, I called on the Lord in my distress. Now, we, all of us know that, that idea of when we're in distress, when we're in pain, when we're hurt, and we call on the Lord. And he, David said this, and the translation is, The Lord answered me, and He set me in a broad place. Several translations of that are, He set me in a prosperous place. He set me in a place of abundance when I called upon the Lord. With the same imagery and the same idea of, of Psalm 23 here, when he says he prepares the table, David said, I called on Him. And he set me in this broad place, this place of his blessing in my life. And that's the actual meaning behind it all. And he said, the Lord is at my side and I will not fear what man can do to me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I, I just hope you today, as you see the imagery of this shepherd, I hope you see the imagery of a, of a shepherd and a Lord and a God who loves us, who cares for us, who has our our best and our benefit in His mind, but who also, because He loves us, allows us to walk through the valleys, allows us to walk through the times and the shadows of death and the hurts and the pains and the punishment, so that as we come through, as we come through, as we face the things we face, we know that God is with us. And, and I can't ever begin to tell you how and why all of these valleys happen. A good friend of ours in America, a pastor that's uh, my age, maybe a few years younger than I am, uh, just lost his wife this week uh, to cancer. She had had, had the disease for some, uh, some time and been, been strongly battling it by faith, but she today she's with the Lord. And, and I can't explain that valley, and I can't understand why that happens, and I don't have the answers, but I know as that man and his children and just walk with the Lord and follow the Lord and trust the Lord. I know that there will be a time that the Lord will lay a table in front of them and He will spread His abundance and His love and His peace and His mercy. As I go back now and I jump back to that uh, idea of this actually being a, a table like our tables, 
uh, in our teaching today. I personally believe that David was continuing the sheep, shepherd sheep analogy, but I can easily see a dual picture coming to David's mind as he was leading his father's sheep and remembering the times when he led his father's sheep up to that grassy land because he was a poet and because he was a writer of, of such beautiful psalms and beautiful uh, uh, lyrics that he did that he would, he would even relate that place and, and picture it as some of the tables that he personally had sat at and over his life and now that he's in the end of his life looking back and he could look and talk, think about the time when he was at his father's table, his father Jesse who was a shepherd and at the time when they would end at the end of their, uh, their sheep drive for that year and they had taken the sheep successfully and brought the sheep to market successfully and come back that when they would do that they'd have a big celebration and the father would kill the fatted cat uh, we know that story from one of Jesus' parables. And, and they would have that great time at his father's table, also at the king table of uh, King Saul when he would sit there under the, with his feet put under the table of King Saul and, and maybe even the table himself that he set and others. And, and I can see David having that in his mind. And, and as we've said over and over in our teaching on Psalm 23, throughout the Bible we are referred to as sheep. And that analogy of sheep and the shepherds and the pastoral lands and all that. Last week I told us that's been used over 600 times in the Bible. But we also have to remember that's not the only only way God sees us. God sees us as sheep. God sees us as servants. God also sees us as His sons. Uh, and he, there's a point in time that He even calls us, that it says that we are a friend of God. So God sees us and He even relates to us in many different ways. And all of them are levels of, of re relationship, levels of maturity, of, of intimacy as we come closer and closer to the Lord our God. And that greatest thing of being a son or being a daughter, being grafted into the Lord. And as David writes this psalm, I, I don't find it hard to believe that he remembers all the times in his life, in his life, after his valleys, after his battles, after his victories, and sometimes after his defeats, he remembers the many times tables have been spread for him and the times even he welcomed guests into his banqueting table after becoming a king himself. And one of the beautiful stories, and I'm not going to really get into this story, but I am going to come back to it in weeks to come because I want to dig into this story a little more. One of the beautiful stories and the beautiful examples we find about this uh, where there's actually a table that's brought into the picture with David is uh, when David now is king and he's been, he's been anointed by the uh, people of, uh, of Judah, his own people. He's been anointed by Israel now as king and he's been accepted to be the king and he's uh, in his palace uh, there in Jerusalem and one day he he just gets in his heart that he needs to do something to remember Jonathan because you remember Jonathan even though Jonathan was the son of King Saul Jonathan probably was the closest friend David ever had on this earth and even though Jonathan knew that David would be the king someday Jonathan still loved David and and was willing to give up the line of being a king in order to protect David and to keep David. And David wanted to do something and he found out that Jonathan had a son. That son's name was Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth was a young boy that had, had, had been injured as a young child and he was lame in both of his legs. And the Bible tells us very beautifully, and, I, and like I said, I'm not going to get into this story uh, so heavily, but David finds him in a little place called Lodabar uh, there in the lands of Israel. And he brings Mephibosheth back to the palace and he restores Mephibosheth. And what the, what the narrative tells us, it tells us twice there in 2 Samuel chapter 9, but verse 13 says that, that from that day forth, Mephibosheth lived and he put his feet under the table of the king. And there's, so there's something special about a table in our lives. And looking back over life, as he remembers leading his own sheep to those high plateaus where the grass was plentiful, he can also call to mind all the times in his life when he all seemed lost and his shepherd would come in and his shepherd would would provide a place of respite. His shepherd would provide a place of rest. His shepherd would provide a place for restoration for him, a place to nurture him, 
and bless him with many wonderful blessings. Time and time again, God brought David back to a table. And that table that he would bring David to, David sat down and David rest and he rejoiced and he rejuvenated himself. And, and I began to think about things that tables provide for us. I've got a list of about 10 things here, nine or 10 things, I think it's nine, uh, things here that tables, that, we, that tables bring back to our lives. And they, parts that they played in my life. And what I want you to do, each, each week I give you something that I want you to text back to me, maybe some answers. Most of you don't do it, and shame on you for not doing it. I wish you would. Today I'm going to give you another challenge to do that. I'd like for you to think of some places or things that happened at a table for you in your life. And it can either be a dining room table or even in a living room set uh, where you have your tables. And I know a lot of our families here, uh, when we, especially when we have big groups over, we don't sit at a table because a table is too small, but we sit around the living room and we bring the small tables and everybody sits at that table. But any kind of a table, and I want you to let me know some of the things that come to your mind when you think about the table at your home or a table at uh, a place that you visit often, uh, a table that means something special to you. These are some of the things that a table, I found that a table provides that have in my life uh, and things I could think of. It's a place to sit and to belong. A table is a place to sit and belong. It's, uh, it takes me back to uh, when I was a boy going to my grandmother's house, both on both of my, side, my parents' sides, but mostly my dad's side. We would go to his family uh, down to see his, his folks a lot more uh, than we would my mom's folks for some reason. I don't know why. That's just the way it was, the way we did it. And my grandmother always had in her kitchen table, wasn't a big table, but she would always have six, eight, ten chairs, uh, usually six around the table, and there'd be two in this corner and two over in this corner, and they could bring them, and people would put chairs and every time you went there if there were people there they were around the table and you just felt like you belonged even now when Sherry and I go home and even though our kids have been raised a lot different than most children have, our children don't really have that that place or that home to belong but where we have is my mom and dad's house and thankfully right now we still have that even though mom and dad are both gone my brother has been keeping that house and a few years ago Sharon and I started helping him remodel that house and we have a table there now and uh, every time we go home even if it's for a few weeks we try to get the kids to come to that table just so they have a place to say they belong this is home to them it's a place of nourishment over the years all the times I've gotten nourishment at different tables in life from my, my wife and my table at our home from my mother-in-law's table who's such a wonderful cook from my mom and from all the many other people that we've known and loved over the years the table is a place to get nourishment and to get strength it's a place to share memories and to reminisce. I can't tell you the times over the years that we've sat at tables. My brothers and I just not too long ago when we were home uh, do that. And I, my family doesn't talk a lot. The people who do it is Sharon's family. We'll get to sitting around the table with some of her family, those who are still living. Uh, and we'll talk and we'll laugh. Sometimes it's around uh, the proverbial table or, or the, the real table. Sometimes it's that proverbial table sitting in a living room or even sitting outside in chairs under a tree. And just telling stories and reminiscing and laughing and sharing memories and thinking about things and sometimes you would inevitably be catching yourself wiping tears because sometimes the laughter would go to stories that brought sadness uh, joy in your heart but sadness because of the love loved ones that have gone on and the the tough times that life has given us sometimes the table is a place to share your heart it's a time when you have to share the things that are close to you. And sometimes when you're, uh, when you're in leadership, you bring people around the boardroom table and you sit and share the things and the plans and the things on your heart. Sometimes as a family, you sit down and you talk about things like, uh, like the, the future and where we're going. And you talk about things like, do you have wills? Have you prepared your, uh, your estates for when you pass away? And those type things. But then there's also other times that you just share what's on your heart talking about the things of the Lord and sometimes you just sit across sit at a table like across from each other sometimes when Sharon and I want to do some talking we'll go to a little coffee shop somewhere and we'll sit down and have a cup of coffee and we'll just sit there and we'll talk about uh, what's planning this year what's planning next year sometimes we have our calendars out and sometimes we're just talking about uh, about things uh, and I don't do that enough I'm not the biggest talker in the world or the best talker in the world uh, but I do try uh, I remember one time I was sitting at a table and Sharon and I 
uh, shared with my mom and dad. This was back in 1993, I guess. Uh, shared with my mom and dad that uh, we had been called to be missionaries and we were going to be leaving to go to Africa. And at that time, I was the only one of my brothers who were married, and I'm the only one that had any children. Uh, and we had two children, and Janine was on the way when we gave that, uh, that big announcement uh, there. And uh, uh, my dad just, uh, boy, he got up from the table and never said a word. And he just, I remember it clear as day, he walked away from the table and for hours never spoke to me. Not that he was mad or upset. He was just knew that life was getting ready to change and he was very sad. It's a place to laugh. I can't tell you the times with good friends and family and just people I've sat at tables and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and just told jokes and told stories and, and just shared things of the past. And it's also a time that we've cried, a place that we've sat and cried. We've learned of the death of a loved one. We've learned that the uh, situation that has happened and people's lives were lost or we had a church that, that rebelled and went away from us. So we, you know, just all those, those horrible stories. Sometimes it seems like we gather around tables to talk about that. A table is a place where we can renew acquaintances and even begin relationships. Mine and Sharon's relationship began over a table at a little place called Da Vinci's Pizza in Athens, Georgia. And we went there, and the first night we went out, I mean, we had a little drive in the car, but the relationship really started sitting at a table. Uh, and uh, so many of our relationships of people that we know now well and dear, it started because they invited us to their house. We invited them to, their, uh, to our house. Uh, we went out to a restaurant, and we sat at a table, and we began to share our hearts, share our lives. It's a place to share good news, and it's a place sometimes to give bad news. Also, the last one I have is a place for sharing devotions. A table is a, a, a beautiful place, and whether it's a table that God has laid off in splendor out in the, out in the beautiful plateau lands of the high, highlands of, of Israel or Africa or America for the sheep to graze at, or whether it's a table set in splendor in your home or even in a restaurant, it's a place to know and see and Feel the blessings of God in your life. David is reminding us in this psalm that as we allow the Lord to shepherd us and all that that entails of Him being leaders, that through the good times and the bad times, there will always be a place of His blessing and a place to feel, a place that feels like home. And that's what preparing that table in the presence of our enemies means to me. And if I can quickly look at the two other phrases, and I've gone about 40 minutes, and I think I can finish in about five to seven more minutes, uh, I want to do this. David also said quickly there, he said, He anointeth my head with oil in the King James. And uh, we would say it, He anoints my head, our head with oil. In Philip Keller's book, he talks about and tells us at certain times of year, especially it seems like it was the times when they climbed up out of that valley and got up to those pasture lands, that they were uh, the the area the 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 uh, terrain of that time that there would be outbreaks of flies, pests, and parasites. And the parasite was a a little mite type of an insect that would get into the to the wool of the sheep and and even get down into their ears and up in their noses. And and if not taken care of and not dealt with, these parasites uh, and these mites would could actually even bore their way into through the skull or in through the ear canals and get up into the brains of the sheep. And it would literally drive the sheep crazy. And, he, and they uh, would even get a disease. Uh, in, uh, in his writings, he called it scabe. But I think I've always heard it in my uh, la very minimal lack of shepherding or knowing things about animals was scabies. And what it is, it's just a, a rash that breaks out from these these parasites, these flies, these mites that get into the skin. And because sheep uh, have a tendency, especially when they're in pasture lands, when they're having good times, when they're having fun, they start rubbing together, they rub their heads together, they mate in these places that if one sheep has the parasites, when he goes and rubs against the other sheep and they butt their heads and they nuzzle together, they pass these parasites on to the other sheep and the other sheep. And if a shepherd does not take care of this enemy, this enemy can destroy his flock quicker than the poisons, quicker than the wild animals and the ravenous beasts out there. This one small little mite, this small little parasites can destroy a whole flock of sheep. But the shepherd 
in his wisdom as a, a shepherd who loves and a shepherd who leads, he would come up with a mixture. And they had a mixture of different types of oils. Some even put tar. Some even put other types of chemicals and, and things that would either kill the animals or kill the pest or the smell would be so pungent the pest would not bother their sheep. And they would anoint their sheep, and they would especially anoint around their, their heads, their ears, their eyes, and their nostrils, all those places where there was a, a, a place where the, these pests could get in, and even on their backsides in their private areas, they would even anoint and put the oil there to keep anywhere the pest could get in to keep them away from that place. And, and it's interesting to note here, and, and, and this is the most important part of today's message, maybe if you're looking for a nugget, uh, I hope all of it's been good to you, but if you're looking for a nugget, it's very interesting to note that in Psalm 23, he does not use the common word for anoint. We see anointing all throughout the Old Testament especially, but we see it in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, every time someone's anointed, most of the time, and I didn't go through every word for anointing, so I'm not going to say every time, but most of the time, the word that's translated anointing is a word, mashak. Even the term when Jesus is referred to in um, Hebrew, he's called, uh, he's called mashiha. Mashihak, I can't really say that like well, but uh, uh, there was, it used to be a song a guy sang was Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah in Hebrew. And that was the anointed one. And that's the word that's commonly used. When Saul anointed David, he poured the flask of oil on his head and it flowed down onto David. He mashaked David. He anointed him that way. But here in Psalm 23, there may be a few other instances in the Bible. I couldn't find them, but just to leave myself some, some uh, breathing room there so somebody didn't come back and say, Oh, Pastor Ron, you got that wrong. And I know none of you would do that. I know that. But uh, just, just to give myself protection. There might be another use or two, but it's the only one I could find. The word used here is called dishanta. D-I-S-H-A-N-T-A. And where the word mashak means to pour, to anoint, to spread, this word, the literal meaning of dishanta is to fatten the head. In other words, to take like a fat lard, like, like oil when it's gotten congealed into a lard type of substance. Here in Kenya, it'd be like a kimbo, uh, that type of a lard. And you would take that fat lard and you would rub it on something and rub it into something. It was not really so much a pouring of a liquid oil, but it was the rubbing of almost a congealed, solidified oil. And what the shepherd would do and what this was saying is that he would take that fat, that oil, and he would vigorously rub it on the ears and on the nose and around the eyes and the mouth and vigorously rub it in in the Middle East and, and, and I hope you're already getting a feeling of what I'm coming to because uh, I'm not digging into this very deep just very shallow in the Middle East especially in the ancient times another story tells us if we go to that other picture of going to someone's house is that when you would visit someone's house there in the Middle East and you would arrive at this home, they would uh, always provide you, if they had, they would provide you with water to wash yourself. And you would wash your, sometimes in, in nice homes, and especially if you were a, a guest of some renown, they would even wash your feet for you. But they would even give you water to wash your hands and to wash your face and maybe even to wet your hair and clear the dust out of your hair. But in a nice home, in a, in a, in a home where they follow tradition well, once you did that, you would come and you would sit and the, the head of that home or one of the head servants in that home would come and they would take oil and they would wipe it and rub it all over your face and on your ears. And I, I couldn't find out if they did it in the hair or not. I, don't, I wouldn't think you would, but you never know. They could have. But they would rub it all in the face. They would rub it on the hands and on the feet of the person coming in. And they would do this as a, as a, a welcome but it was also to tell this person that as you come into our culture, we know that the sun has been harsh to your skin and you've been dried out by the heat and by the wind and by the dust. And we want to replenish you and we want to restore the nutrients to yourself and to your skin. And David is telling us that our shepherd, he doesn't just come and pour oil on our head, but the shepherd takes oil in his hands. And when he takes that oil in his hands, he takes it and he rubs it over us with the beautiful, powerful hands. And if we take that into the New Testament illusion, those, those nail-scarred hands that Jesus 
offered out on the cross for us. He takes those hands and He rubs that anointing into our lives. He rubs it into our heads to calm all the, the, the craziness that's going on there. He rubs it into our face to bring back the joy and to bring back the gladness. He rubs it into us. That anointing is put on us to defeat and to destroy the attacks of the enemy on our life. In a translation, in one translation of Isaiah 10, 27, he's using this same analogy, this same idea, and he says when, you, when he anoints that way, that anointing breaks the yoke of the enemy in our lives, and it breaks the yoke of the enemy over our families, and it breaks the yoke of the enemy in our homes. Hallelujah. And I hope today that you will just say, lift your hands to the shepherd and say, shepherd, don't just pour the oil on my head, but take your hands and rub that anointing oil in my life. Rub it on my heart. Rub it in my hands. Rub it in my soul so that I am completely saturated in the beautiful presence of your Holy Spirit. And in the last thing David talks about, he talks about a cup that is full to overflowing. And again, there's, there, there's lots I could say about this phrase, but my time is running out and I, I, I really didn't want to go this long. But basically what he's talking about, as David climbed up or, and the shepherds climbed up with the sheep up that mountain out of the valley, from the time they left the valley to the time they got to that tableland, there was very little water. The only water maybe they would have is what the shepherds were carrying in bags and, and skins on their shoulders. And they may be able to go by and give each sheep just a little small bit in a cup. And they would let each sheep take just a little bit of water. But when they cleared over that valley, one of the first places they would go to, the shepherd would have already found a watering hole. And he would take that watering hole, and if it was a place where it was a, a maybe a stream, he would have already dug out troughs there where he could have brought water to. And when those sheep would have gotten to the places where those water troughs were, they would not just be water in the bottom of them, but the water would be, the shepherd would be pouring water from the hole, from the well, from the stream. He would be pouring it into those troughs. And as he poured it into those troughs. He never let the troughs become empty. But every time every a whole other group of sheep would come up the water would continually be flowing and it would be overflowing and there was plenty of water. And that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the plentiness, the overflowingness that there is in God's serving God and walking with God, living with God. He will always provide that fresh living water that is overflowing in our lives. Joy, uh, the Bible says that Weeping endures for the night, but it's only for a night. The joy, the overflowing joy will come in the morning. He brought water from a rock in the wilderness uh, to overflow Israel's cup. He caused Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to find places to dig wells and water that sustained not only their people, but the nations of peoples that came after them. And even today, as we talked about a few weeks ago, you can go to Israel and find a well that Jacob dug under the anointing of God that is still overflowing cups. And Jesus said, with that woman at that same well and that woman was drawing water and she said how can you ask me to draw you water and Jesus said woman if you only knew the water I could give you I could give you a water that would continually overflow in your life and you would never thirst again and that's the kind of water that our father gives us the same way that shepherd led his sheep to that table land that table that was surrounded by enemies but he provided a safe place to eat he provided a safe place for them to be anointed from past he also also provided overflowing water that they could drink and drink till they just got sick of drinking anymore. And the Lord wants to do that in your life. The psalmist David says this in Psalm 16. And he said this when he was running from Saul. Uh, he wrote this when he was running from Saul and he was living out in the wilderness. He said, in his presence there is joy. And at his right hand there is pleasure in abundance forevermore. So everything God does for us, there may be seasons and tough times, but even in the hardest of times, we can find the abundance and the overflowing of God's joy and God's blessing in our life. And Paul says this, and I close with this in Ephesians. In chapter 3, starting with verse 17, and we know this well, this passage well, and he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people, and this is what I wanted you to see, to grasp how wide, how long, how high, 
and how deep is the love of God. And, and the reality is there is no limit to it. It is an overabundant, overflowing love that flows. It's not a love that can be fit into a box. It can't be measured, the height, the depth, the width. It can't be the volume of it. It can't be described because it's always in abundance and overflowing. And that's what Paul says. And that you would know that and to know that this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Not the fullness of you, but that you would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that you ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So to that God who, who does abundantly above, He always wants to do abundantly above and beyond. And He wants to break out of all of the, 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 uh, the cups and the vessels that we have. He wants you to know that He is a God who blesses you. A God who continually, even through your hardest times of life, He brings blessing and overflow into our lives as we follow Him, as we continue with Him, and as we serve Him. The old songwriter wrote, and I think it's a song that some of you know, know, he said in this first verse, when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, and you have to understand that, that old English language of that time. He says, when you are discouraged and you think that all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done and what that songwriter is saying. Don't just focus on the tough things. Don't focus on the hard things. Don't just focus on your problems. Begin to focus on your blessings. Begin to focus on the things in your life that are benefiting, the things in your life that you see as a blessing from God and begin to count those blessings. And as you begin to count them, he says, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Then he says in the last verse of that song, he said, so amid the conflict, conflict whether great or small. Do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will come and attend, help and comfort to give you even to your journey's end. And then in the course, he just says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Amen. And I hope this has been a blessing to you today. And I hope that you will feast at the table of the Lord and that you will begin to remember the blessing of the Lord when He'll anoint you and that your cup will overflow as you serve Him and as you walk with Him. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for this time to be together with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. I pray that You'd watch over them. I pray that You would comfort them. You would keep them. You would let Your face shine upon them and You would be gracious unto them. And I pray that any who are going through, uh, have gone through the valleys we talked about in the last few weeks today, they've seen that, God, You want to lead them to a beautiful table. And that the table that you've led them to is a table that's filled with lots and lots of food and lots of lots of blessings and lots of lots of encouragement. And I pray that you would be that ever-present help in our lives, that you would do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or what we think according to the power that is at work within us. And we will be careful to give you the glory and the power and the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I trust this word has been a blessing to you today. I trust as you walk with the Lord and you continue to serve the Lord that you'll find grace and peace and, and, and joy and, and happiness and, and just find the comfort that there is in walking with the Savior. And I pray that He would be with you. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, just simply ask Him right there where you are. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and, and cleanse me of all the unrighteousness in my life. Today, I give my life to you and I ask you, Lord, to come into my life and I ask you to, to make me new again. I confess with my mouth, you are my Lord. And I believe in my heart that Jesus died, he was buried, but that he rose again and he still lives today. And one day soon, he's coming back to be with me. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for being with us. I pray that uh, you'll stay in touch with us. Join us tonight. 
at 6 o'clock as we kick off our prayer revival. And tonight, we'll, I don't have the list before me, the things sharing today we're going to do, but we'll start off tonight really just talking about the goodness of the Lord and worshiping the Lord. And then every night this week, we'll pray about a different area, a different thing. If you have needs, I'm sure you'll be able to send your request and things in, and we'll pray for specific needs and requests as well. So God bless you. God be with you. God watch over you, and God keep you as you serve Him and as you follow the Lord. Amen. We love you in the love of Jesus. God bless you.